In this introductory message, we provide interesting background and overview of Romans. In chapter 1, we understand that God has made himself known to us, yet we willfully wander away from our Creator and face its consequences. Starting today, over the next two months, we're going to be studying the book of Romans. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans. We can start, turn now to chapter 1, but we will start from the last chapter uh, of Romans. But I want to give a little background to Romans. You know, so we, we can study God's Word in many different ways. We can do thematic topics, uh, thematic studying, which is what we do most often, study a theme in Scripture. Uh, but we can also study the Word of God by just studying through a book. And that's what, we, what we're going to do now. We're going to study through Romans. In the past, we've done uh, other books in the Bible. We've gone through verse by verse. And, uh, you know, we've covered, I think, uh, Ephesians. We've done First and Second Timothy and so on. So today, we're going to start this very important epistle. Paul's epistle to the believers at Rome. Uh, and I don't want to elevate one book over the other, but... Uh, Romans is considered the most important book theologically or doctrinally, right? Uh, it's the, it deals with the doctrine of Christ. Uh, it presents the gospel of Jesus Christ to us uh, like no other epistle. So Paul's epistle to the believers at Rome or the epistle to the Romans is, uh, is, uh, is often considered by scholars as, you know, his most important work doctrinally. So it's very important that as we are studying uh, Romans. So we're going to spend two months, June, July. Uh, today we'll just cover chapter one, but as we pick up speed, we'll probably do more chapters uh, uh, during our Sunday morning service. So what I encourage all of us to do is to please try and read through this uh, during the course of these two months. So at home, just read through as many chapters as you can and you come here and you know it'll just help us uh, uh, discover these things um, uh, quicker. So just a little bit of background. I spent a few moments here on the background to this Paul's, Paul's epistle to the believers at Rome. Um, you know in his second missionary journey which uh, was somewhere around AD 49 to 52. In the second missionary journey, Paul came into a, 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 a city called Corinth. And many of you will remember, this is in Acts, the 18th chapter. He comes to Corinth, and there at Corinth, he meets this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And Aquila and Priscilla are Jewish believers who actually come from Rome. So in AD 49, uh, the Roman emperor Claudius had banished all the Jewish believers and said, you've got to leave Rome Go wherever. And so Aquila and Priscilla were banished out of Rome. They were sent out. So they landed up in Corinth. And Paul was there at that same time with the intent of planting a church in Corinth. And so they worked together. Many of you are familiar with that, how Paul teamed up with Aquila and Priscilla. And they, helped, they worked together to plant this church in Corinth. So that was probably a time when, God, when Paul got firsthand reports about the church in Rome. That these believers in Rome were, you know, doing well and so on and so forth. Uh, the believers in Rome, the church in Rome was a mixed community. You had Jewish believers and you also had non-Jewish believers, Greeks and Rome, uh, Romans and others who were, you know, Gentiles you would call them. So there was a mixed community. And so Paul had to be sensitive in his, in his episode when he writes, he's addressing both Jews and and non-Jews or Gentiles. And so that's where you'll find that suddenly as he's talking about doctrine, suddenly in chapters 9 to 11, he's beginning to focus on God's dealing with the Jewish people. Uh, you'll find that. And so it's like he's taken a little intermission to go off on some other story and come back. But he's done it intentionally because in that church at Rome, there is also a part of that church that are Jewish believers and he needs to explain to them hey as as the gospel is going out into the old world God hasn't forgotten you there is something oh, God hasn't forgotten the Jews uh, there is something still that God has for them and so he takes that intermission comes back so Paul um, he got as you know he, he's introduced to the believers at Rome during their second missionary journey when he meets with Aquila and Priscilla now on his third missionary journey uh, which is uh, again estimated around 80 53 to 80 58 Paul comes back once again uh, into the 
province of Greece, and uh, he's most likely at Corinth, and I'll tell you why uh, we think he's at Corinth. Uh, and from there, he writes to the believers at Rome. So this episode, Paul's epistle to the believers at Rome, to, to the Romans, is dated as AD 57. So he probably wrote this at, at that time. And remember, these dates are estimates. You know, we, we, we think he, that's when he wrote it. AD 57, and most likely written from Corinth. Why do we say that he's wrote it from Corinth? So if you go with me to the last chapter, Romans 16, uh, so... Uh, just, to, just to give us a background, in Romans 16 and verse 23, um, Paul says this, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother. So, he's making mention of... Uh, Gaius, he's saying, Gaius, my host. That means I'm staying at Gaius's home. So Paul and his missionary journeys, probably, you know, staying in different people's homes. And here he's saying, I'm staying in the house of Gaius. Now, if you turn, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, you find Gaius's name there, a believer from Corinth. So that's one reason why we say it's very likely these two men are the same. Now, it doesn't mean that there are only two, one man named Gaius. There could be many people. But we're saying very likely that, you know, he's referring to the same Gaius. He's saying, Gaius, my host. I'm staying in his house. But another very interesting thing is he mentions this man named Erastus, the treasurer of the city. Or uh, in the Greek, it simply means the steward. Uh, uh, the man who's taking care of the city. The NIV translates it as the head of the public works of the city. Now, in 1920... When archaeologists were excavating uh, part of Corinth and uh, uh, they were actually excavating a street um, which was laid around in the first century, they found a stone that had this inscription on it. And again, uh, I'm just paraphrasing here. It says, Erastus, the head of public works, paved this road at his own expense. And Paul says here, Erastus, the treasurer of the city. Right? So you can find this up online. You go to biblearchaeology.com or something. You'll find this and they'll give you the picture of the stone with this inscription on it. All right? So you can see it. That's very interesting. That they actually found a stone with the name of this guy saying he paved this road in the city of Corinth dating back to the first century. And here Paul is saying, Erastus, the city treasurer or the head of public works, uh, is there. Amen? You're not excited. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. So, because of this, uh, we, we, we say that he most likely wrote this epistle from Corinth, uh, AD 57, and he wrote this to the people are the believers at Rome. Now, while Paul was there on his third missionary journey, he was having a really rough time in that region. From Macedonia, he came down to Achaia. These are districts. The Macedonian church, we know, Philip, we studied this in, I mean, a couple of weeks ago when he talked about generosity. He talked about churches in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. That's in the region of Macedonia. He comes down south into Greece, and he was having a very difficult time, facing a lot of persecution. Uh, and and, and, and at, at that time, he's writing to the believers at Rome. And if you look at, look at me, look with me in, 15, in Romans chapter 15. We'll read verses 22 to 33. Because just again, we're starting in the back just to give a little background uh, to this episode. He says here in verse 22, he's writing to these believers. He says, for this reason, I also, this is Romans 15, 22. Romans 15, 22. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts, that means, look, you know, I'm being chased out everywhere from, you know, in these parts, start referring to a Macedonia and Achaia, uh, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. So he's saying, guys, I want to go to Spain, and as I make my journey to Spain, I plan to make a stop over at Rome. 
and see you. For I hope to see you on my, on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. I want to come and fellowship with you guys in Rome for some time. Verse 25, Romans 15. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So remember, we talked about him receiving the collection from the churches in Macedonia. You all remember? Those of you who were on summer make, you missed it. <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. Uh, we talked about this uh, when, he, when we did generosity. How they were collecting, you know, uh, taking up an offering to help the believers in Jerusalem. So that's what he's referring to here. He says, verse 25, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed. And they are their debtors, for if the Gentiles have been partakers of the spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. So I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to hand over these offerings to them. And then I'm going to come, go to Spain. I'm going to stop in Rome and then go on from there. Verse 29. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. He says, please pray for me. Verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So that's just a little background to this episode. That Paul is saying, look, I am heading, I, I want to go to Spain, but I want to stop there uh, with you. Uh, I spent some time with you at Rome. I want to finish my work in Jerusalem first, and then I will make this trip. So let's go to chapter 1. So today we're going to spend our time in uh, chapter 1. And uh, uh, before we just get in there, I want to give you just a little, a few, three important points about uh, highlights, the key highlights of Paul's episode to the, Rome, to the Romans. First of all, it is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So really, Romans is Paul's, I wouldn't, uh, Paul's uh, explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So over and over again, he will keep referring to this. Gospel, 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 gospel. It's his explanation, an elaborate explanation of the gospel. Like no other episode. That's the first thing. Secondly, Romans is a description of our spiritual journey. So you'll find your journey, my journey, our description, a description of our spiritual journey in Romans. Starting from chapter 1, he talks about God and he talks about our sin and how we've all wandered away from God. Chapter 2, how God is trying to reach us through a witness of our own conscience. Chapter 3, the consequence of sin. We've all got to come under it. Chapter 4, it's by faith that we can be justified. Chapter 5, through Christ's work, we receive God's grace and righteousness. So he talks about salvation. Then chapter 6, but salvation also includes getting sin out of your life. So he deals with that in chapter 6 and 7. And then chapter 8, he says, you know, it's by the Holy Spirit that we as believers can actually live a righteous life. Chapter 8. Chapter 9 to 11, like I said earlier, it's a little digression. He talks about uh, the Jews and God's plan for the Jews. So he takes that little digression. Then he comes back. Chapter 12 to chapter 15 is how to live the Christian life. In relation to other believers, in relation to government, in relation to believers who may not necessarily see things the way you see it. How do you relate to all of them? So that's living the Christian life. Chapters 12 to 15. So really, Romans is a description of our spiritual journey. How from being sinners, we get saved, we get delivered, and we can live a victorious Christian life with the help of the Holy Spirit. And what that Christian life looks like in relation to other people and government and so on. The third important highlight about the book of Romans is this word righteousness. You'll find this again repeated throughout. Probably the, one of the words he uses very often throughout this episode, righteousness. About 36 times he talks about being righteous, righteousness. So he begins by talking about the righteousness of God. God being a righteous God. Therefore he cannot tolerate sin. Then he talks about God being a righteous God who can forgive sin and still be righteous. 
because the price was paid. Then he talks about how God gifts his righteousness to us. That we too can receive righteousness. Then he talks about how we can live right, righteous. Because God has dealt with the issue of sin. And then he says how, what a righteous Christian life looks like. Chapters 12 to 15. You with me? So righteousness is a theme, a common theme throughout this episode. We can close our service today. And you would have still learned something. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. But let's read chapter 1. <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Verse 1. All right. So we're just going to read and we'll make comments as we go along. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Paul, a bond servant. A bond servant is a servant who is completely sold out to his master for the rest of his life. And he's done it by choice. Sometime back, we explained what a bond servant is. You know, at the end of every seven years, the servant has the freedom to go on. But he chooses to remain under his master and for the rest of his life. And then a master puts a sign on his ear saying, okay, he's a bond servant. So Paul says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. I belong to him now. It's interesting to see that he talks about whose he is before who he is. I'm a bond servant and I'm called to be an apostle. Most of us would have put apostle first. Hey guys. Hello. Paul, apostle. I happen to be a servant. <laughs> no, no, no. Paul, a servant. And I happen to be called to be an apostle. Right? So I think that's something you and I must treasure in our hearts. Look, your role in the body doesn't matter. Some of us are called to be pastors, this, that, whatever. You know, we're all called. It's, it's God's choosing. He calls us to be something. Called to be an apostle. Called to be this. Called to be that. Wonderful. But born servant. I belong to him. All of me is his. That's what matters. Whose you are. Right? And by the way, I do this for the Lord. You know, I am an apostle, called to be an apostle. And then he says, separated to the gospel. So he's saying, look, he has, I am totally set apart for this one thing, the gospel. So right now we set the stage. This thing is about the gospel. It's about this good news, this message. I'm separated unto the gospel. Now for Paul, when he says I'm separated unto the gospel, what he is saying is, Everything I have, this is Philippians 3, I have counted it as rubbish. You know, now in Paul's life, you could imagine he must have been like a double PhD in our day. Graduated from, I don't know, pick the best university in the world. Harvard, MIT, Yale, whatever. Okay? That's Paul. And he's saying, I count all that as rubbish. To be separated for one thing, the gospel. So when he says, I'm separated from the gospel, it's not a small thing. I mean, for him, I have left everything. He was a Pharisee. I mean, he'd made it to the top of his, you know, of his uh, stand, in standing, in, top, uh, in social standing. He was a Pharisee. He studied under Gamaliel and he highly educated and everything. He says, I've left all that for one thing, to be separated for the gospel. And then he explains to us, verse 2, what is this gospel? He says in verse 2, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. Sorry, verse 2. Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So what is this gospel? Verse 2 says that this gospel was promised by the prophets in the Old Testament. See the gospel is not something God thought of suddenly in the book of Acts. No. The gospel Paul says in verse 2 it was spoken by the prophets in the Holy that means the gospel started there. In fact, with Abraham. And God called him out. Say, Abraham, come on out. 
the gospel. I will, through you, I will bless all the nations. Amen? So the gospel is not something that just came out in the new. It was there in the old. And so you and I read the Old Testament scriptures to really understand what is being taught to us in the new. Because the gospel is hidden there in the Old Testament. And he says that in verse 2. And the gospel, verse 3, is concerning Jesus Christ our Lord. So the gospel is about Jesus. And this Jesus had a natural lineage. He was born of the seed of David. But really, more importantly, he was the son of God. Having been raised from the dead. So more important than him coming from the lineage of David was the fact that this gospel is about Jesus Christ who has been raised from the dead. No other man like this. Are you with me so far? Yes. So the gospel is about Jesus who is declared to be the Son of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. He's been raised from the dead. And notice verse 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are in Rome beloved of God called to be saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ verse 5 through Jesus we have received grace and apostleship that word apostleship simply means commissioning now all of us here today have a commission. And one statement we always make is every believer is a minister. Amen? So tell your neighbor, you are a minister. <laughs> every believer is a minister. Each one of us have received a commission. God hasn't forgotten you. He said, okay, sorry. All you do is sit on your chair. <laughs> no. Every one of us have received, you know, this apostle, word apostleship sounds very great. But it literally means commissioning, sending out. Through Jesus, we have all received grace, which is divine empowering in our lives. And commissioning. For your commissioning, you have all the necessary empowering. Amen? Amen? God never gives you commission without grace. God never gives you a commission without the grace. Through him, we have received grace and commissioning. See, there is already grace for you to fulfill the commission God has given to you. Now, he has given all of us something different to do. That's fine. But what I want to impress on your heart is there is grace for the commission. And that's been given to you. Amen? Whatever God's commissioned you, there is grace. Through Him, we have received grace and commission. For what? For the obedience of the faith among all nations. That means go to the whole world, get people to be obedient to the faith. Now this phrase, obedience to the faith, is quite interesting in Paul's letters. He uses it often. That means, he, and he uses it in the context of bringing people to the faith. He calls it making people obedient to the faith. Meaning that when we want people to follow Jesus Christ, we're inviting them to come to a place of obedience, of a place of surrender, of a place of yielding to the Lordship of Christ. It's really important. Because some of us say, I like to follow Jesus, but I'll do it my way. Sorry, it's called obedience to the faith. That means you want to follow Jesus, you do it His way. Are you understanding? That means I cannot present the gospel in such a way that says, that leaves the impression, you follow Jesus any way you want to. That is not the gospel. The gospel calls people to the obedience of the faith. You'll find it Roman, later on in Romans 15, he talks about that. To make the Gentiles obedient through word and deed. Obedient, obedience to the faith. So when we are bringing people to the faith, it's an invitation to come into this place of obedience. 
among all nations. And then he mentions three things about believers, talking to believers at Rome and to us as in general. Verse, verse 6 and 7, believers, they are the called of Jesus Christ, they are the beloved of God, and they are called to be saints. So three things, let's say together. I am called of Jesus, I'm beloved of God, I'm called to be a saint. Three things. Called by Jesus Christ. He's called you. How would you feel if, I don't know, pick some big name. This is just example, okay. If the chief minister or the prime minister or the president or some great man called you. You feel happy. Invited you. Come. And he says, we are called by Jesus, every believer, every believer is called by Jesus. Makes you feel good, doesn't it? Hey, Jesus called me. He called you. Called by Jesus Christ. Beloved of God. Every believer is beloved of God. You're a beloved of God. And third, every believer is called to be a saint. Now, we did the series on the holiness of God. It's that same word here, called to be holy. Saint, hagios, holy. So you could just translate it or put it like this. You're called to be holy. Every believer is called to be holy. So when Jesus Christ called you, he called you. You're a beloved of God. But you're called to be holy unto him. Amen? Now, as, uh, you know, as with every letter, there is a from, there is a to, and then there's a reason for the letter. So there's, Paul has, he has, he's done the from, from Paul the apostle, to, to the saints who are at Rome. And now he's giving a little introduction to the letter. Verses 8 onwards. For I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel, once again, in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by some means now at last I may find my way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was, was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to wise and to unwise, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So again, he's using the word gospel. Keep track of that as we go through. So let's summarize this. You know, verse 8 says, uh, he says, you know, I thank my God. So remember, he's, never, he's not yet seen the believers in Rome, but he's thankful to them. I thank my God for you believers at Rome. And then I, he says, I am praying for you. See, some less, something to learn from there. Even if you haven't seen certain believers, if God has put them on your heart, you can always thank God for them and you can always pray for them. For example, maybe God has put the believers in, I don't know, Gujarat. Since you, <laughs> the believers in Gujarat, other, some other part of the world. He's put them on your heart, just like how... The believers in Rome was, were on Paul's heart. He'd been longing to go see them. But he'd not seen them yet. But what did he do? He thanked God for them and he prayed for them. So you and I can do that. So he said, thank my God for you. Very interesting. He says, your faith is spoken of in all the world. Now, obviously, he's meaning the known world. right? Not literally in the sense the whole world. The net then known world. Now Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. 
So what happened in Rome quickly spread across as news across the empire. And he's saying, and all the bits of news going across the Roman Empire, one of them is there are believers in Rome. There are people in Rome who have faith in Jesus Christ. Your faith is spoken of in all the world. Now, I wonder. Now, two things. One, of, first of all, obviously, it shows us the importance of establishing believing communities in cities. Villages are important, but you know, if you and I go and establish a believing community in a town or a city, then the entire region is affected because what happens in the city spreads. And that's exactly how Paul ministered. You'll find he went to the big cities of his day. So what happened in Rome spreads throughout the empire. But the question I want to ask is, is our faith being spoken of? It says your faith is being spoken of throughout the world. I'm praying, God, let our faith be spoken of at least throughout the city. Amen. Let them speak of, there is a group of people there. They believe in Jesus Christ and such and such. They are like this. Their faith is being spoken of. Our faith, let it be spoken of in our city, in our state, in our nation. Amen? Now, the next thing Paul says is, I've been praying for this. He says, uh, let me mention this, verse 9. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel. This is important. I serve with my spirit. He could have said, I serve with my body. I serve with my mind. Now body is important. Mind is important. But where does it first start? It starts in the spirit. Our service of God, our serving God is a spiritual thing. So keep that focus. How? You serve God in the spirit. Spiritually seek him. Spiritually pursue him. Then the natural comes. You know the mind of the body. Of course you train your mind. You take care of your body. All of that. But Serving God is of the Spirit. How are you serving God? In the Spirit. So put the emphasis on the Spirit first. Not on the externals. You know, you've got to look like this. You've got to smell like this. You've got to look. No. That will come later. First, serve God with the Spirit. Spiritual. Now, the next verse, Paul says, I, I've been, verse 10, I've been making requests. If by some means, at last, I would find my way by the will of God to come to you. The King James says, I've been praying to God to give me a prosperous journey to come to you. Is that what it says here? Oh, this is the new King James. All right. The King James. I, and, and he said, I want, I'm praying, God, give me a prosperous journey to come to these believers at Rome. Now, listen carefully. Here's what happened. He's writing this AD 57 from Corinth. From there, he travels back up Macedonia through Troas, all the way back to Jerusalem. As soon as he comes to Jerusalem, the Jews apprehend him, accuse him, hand him over to the Romans. He's escorted from Jerusalem to Caesarea, which is a port town. By a whole army of almost like 400 soldiers escorting one man. Roman soldiers. 400 protecting one man. Escorting him from Jerusalem to Caesarea. I mean that's like high security. For one man. And he's imprisoned in Caesarea for two years. Once again, he, I mean he stands in trial before uh, different kings and... And in Caesarea, he appeals. Finally, he says, I, I, I appeal to Caesar. It's okay. You appeal to Caesar. We'll send you to Rome. So he gets a paid trip to Rome. But it's not a smooth journey. Because they put Paul on a ship with a battalion of soldiers. Along the way, 14 days without food. 
shipwrecked, abandoned on an island, Malta. He lands there, he's collecting wood for fire and a wiper bites him. But nothing happens. So he's worshipped as God. <laughs> then another three month journey finally arrives at Rome. So did God answer his prayer for a prosperous journey? I'm praying God that he would give me a prosperous journey to come to Rome. Is what Paul is saying. And this was his journey. It took him three years. Through the seas. Through shipwreck. And all of that. And he comes to Rome. But in Rome. He's able to spend two full years. Ministering to the church there at Rome. He's under house arrest. But nobody's prevented from coming to him. So he's able to minister freely for two full years. What is Paul's desire? Verse 11. I desire to come to you so that I might impart to you some spiritual gift. Was that accomplished? Yes or no? Yes. But the journey to get there was a little rough. Are you with me? So the point I want to make is this. As believers, we don't measure success by the comfort of the journey. We measure success by the fulfilling of the purpose. Some of you didn't get it. We don't measure success by the comfort of the journey. We measure success by the fulfilling of the purpose. Paul fulfilled that purpose. He was able to be two years in Rome and minister to the saints. See, some of us think, you know, God, give me a prosperous journey. I want a very smooth flight. Take me to Rome, first class. <laughs> then I know I'm anointed by God. Hey, <laughs> something is wrong. Sometimes the journey may be rough, but you measure success not by the ease of the journey, but by the fulfilling of the purpose. Why did Paul want to go to Rome? Verse 11, I desire to come to you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift. Now, that word spiritual gift. Spiritual gift is the word charis, means grace. And I want to leave this with you. You know, when you go to minister to people, even if you're going to meet one person, let's say you're going to meet a friend, say, God, I want to impart some spiritual grace. We can all do that. Amen? I want to impart some spiritual grace. Some spiritual, I mean, it could come through a gift or some other way. But the, what God has given you, you want to impart to them. Paul says, I want to desire, desire to impart to you some spiritual gift of grace. And when you do that, when you have that, he says, then we are both refreshed together. Next verse, verse 12. We are refreshed together. So, just in your, in, amongst us as a community of believers, when you meet with one another, when you fellowship with one another, when you maybe meet at home, whatever, see, so have this in your heart. God, when I go to spend time with this person, I just want to be able to impart some spiritual gift, a, a spiritual grace, something in me I want to just bless that person with. And if I go with that heart, what will happen? He says, we're still, we'll be both encouraged together by the mutual faith. Amen. When you go with desire to bless somebody, you also will be encouraged in your faith. And that's exactly what happens. And then we see Paul's commitment to the gospel, verses 14 and 15, which you just read. He says, look, whether to the Greeks or to the barbarians, to the wise or to the unwise, I'm ready to bring the gospel. That positioning is important. It is true that God had called Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And as a very intellectual man, he could communicate to the intellectual. But look at his willingness. I am ready to bring the gospel to the wise and to the unwise. That means to the educated and the uneducated. I'm ready. 
I'm ready to serve anybody with the gospel. It is true that each one of us may have a certain commission to minister to a certain kind of people, but our readiness must be God, anybody, I'm willing to share the gospel. As long as I can communicate to them, I'm ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? So that was all the easy part. Now he begins the solid description, the doctrine part of the gospel. I'm just going to read that next section together and try to summarize it uh, before we close. So let's read from verse, um, read verse 16, 17, and then we, from verse 18 onwards is when he gets into the doctrine. Let's pick up in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Once again, he's mentioning the gospel. It is a power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God. Remember, we're talking about righteousness. Righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he says, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is for salvation. God wants to save everybody. But now he gets into some serious stuff on how, uh, on, on the presentation of the gospel. Verse 18 onwards. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So now as he begins his whole uh, description of the gospel, he begins with the existence of God and God having revealed himself to us. He says the wrath of God is manifested against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. Because God has left man without an excuse. The atheist may say there is no God, but God says you are without excuse because I'm staring you in the face. The agnostic may say if there is a God, I don't know. God says you are without excuse, I'm looking at you in the face. He says where is that? He says God has given all of them a witness. Where is that witness? He says for the invisible power, verse Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. They're understood by the things that God has created. So God is telling man, my creation is my testimony to you that I am there. And that's all you need. The invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in the things that he has created. And he's saying, because of that, you are without excuse. Creation, it's God's revelation of himself to man. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. So he says in the very beginning, look. God has revealed himself to you and me. We are without excuse. But what has man done? Verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason. God gave them up. To wild passions. For even their women. Exchanged their natural use. For what is against nature. Likewise also the men. Leaving the natural use of the woman. Burned in their lust for one another. Men with men. Committing what is shameful. And receiving in themselves. The penalty of their error. Which was due. 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Let's summarize. What Paul is saying is this, that man, although he has creation staring him in the face and telling him that God is, he chooses to, one, refuse to recognize, refuses to be thankful, refuses to glorify God. He suppresses the truth with a lie. This means it's a willful thing. Suppresses the truth with a lie. I don't want to recognize God. I don't want to glorify God. I don't want to be thankful. I'll suppress the truth with a lie because I want to go my own way. And instead of worshiping the creator, he worships created things. Now here's what happens. Every time we replace God with something from this world, you find three times in this passage, it says, God gave them up. So you want to go? Go. Three times. God gave them. It shows that God honors the free will he's given to us. He honors that. So you want to do this? You want to worship the creature instead of the creator? Fine. We give them up. But every time we replace the creator with something in our world, whether it's idolatry or any other thing, what happens to us? We end up in greater ungodliness, which puts us under the wrath of God. Twice he says, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and righteousness of man. And last verse, verse 32, those who do these things are putting themselves under the righteous judgment of God. Twice he says that. So, when we replace the creator with the created things, I mean, say, God, I don't need you. I'm, I'll, I'm good here. God says, okay. That's what you want. Professing to be wise, you're actually becoming a fool. I'm giving, up, giving you up to your own debased, debased, degraded thinking. That's how you want it. What does it do for us? It takes us out into more and more ungodliness. Are you with me? So this is our condition. Now, we have to stop here in chapter 1. Leave you all hanging there. But... Paul continues in chapter 2. We'll pick that up next Sunday. But this is how he begins. There is God. He's revealed himself to us. But man has chosen, refused to recognize, glorify and thank God. So God says that's your choice. Go your way. And man has now descended into a place of ungodliness. Which has put him in a place under the righteous judgment of God. And God is righteous to judge. It's the righteous judgment. He's not being unrighteous when he's judging this. I even, so this is how he begins. This is, this is the condition of man. But the good, he begins with the good news. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. So we are going to come to the God's plan of salvation. But this is where it all starts. Man has chosen not to believe in God. Walk away from God. And he's now in that place under the judgment of God. But we pick this up next week and, and as we progress and he shows us how not only is God righteous in judging the sin of man, but he's also righteous in forgiving the sin of man. We'll pick that up in chapters 2 and 3. How God is able to forgive our unrighteousness because of Jesus Christ. 
I want to make a mention here in passing how, of course, he lists all kinds of sins, all kinds of wickedness. But it's very clear in chapter 1 of Romans that homosexuality is a sin. I'm highlighting that simply because of all that's going on in our world today. Where people want, uh, of course we love the sinner and God loves the sinner. But there is sin and sin has to be called sin. Amen? Amen? It is very clear in Romans chapter 1 and as well as in other places in scripture that homosexuality is sin. It's not just some different behavior. It is sin. And you call sin, sin. But the good news is the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all. Amen? Even this, there's a gospel can bring salvation to all of us. That's the good news. So we're going to stop here this morning. We're going to pick up in chapter 2 next Sunday as we continue our study in Paul's epistle to the Romans. Let's rise to our feet, please, and I'll just call our worship team up. We're going to pray for a few moments, and then we will dismiss. One of the things we don't hear too much in church these days is that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. Now, why is that important? I want to ask you a question. If a believer commits a murder, and if an unbeliever commits a murder, is it any different in the eyes of God? Yes or no? It's a simple question. If a believer commits a murder and an unbeliever commits a murder, is it different? It is murder. Right? It's not that that's holy murder and this unholy murder. <laughs> it's murder. But sometimes some preachers of the gospel preach as though when a believer sins, that sin is a holy sin. There is no such thing as holy sin. Sin is a sin regardless of who commits it. Amen. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Whether it's committed by a believer or an unbeliever. It's ungodliness. And unrighteousness of man. That means we have to call sin a sin. Regardless of who commits it. The difference is. A believer knows that he can go to God. And say God I'm sorry. The unbeliever may not know. That that's available. But sin. Is sin. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray, please. And if there's anyone here this morning and you have never received Jesus Christ into your life, if maybe you've been questioning the existence of God, is there a God? And God says, I'm giving you my biggest testimony. I'm giving you my greatest evidence. My creation is my evidence to you that I'm there. Face up to the truth. Don't suppress the truth with a lie. Face up to it. Yes, we've all sinned, but the Bible says that God forgives us because of Jesus Christ. He paid for our sins. He died and he rose again. Whoever repents and believes will receive forgiveness. 
If there's anyone here this morning and you feel in your heart, I need to make that decision to believe in Jesus Christ. I want to turn away from my sin. I want to turn away from my own foolishness. I want to turn away from my own degraded thinking. And I want to accept. I want to turn to God. I want to accept Jesus Christ. I want to lead you in a simple prayer this morning. Right where you are, you can pray. And receive forgiveness for your sins. If you've never prayed this way before, you can pray this with me right where you are. Those of you watching online, in your homes, if you've never prayed this way, if you've never prayed and asked Jesus to forgive you your sin and be your savior, you can pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins. I believe you died for me. You were buried and you rose up again. Make me a new person. Make me a child of God. And help me follow you the rest of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone here, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? If you don't mind, could you raise your hand? Anybody, you prayed this prayer with me? For the very first time. Could I see your hand? I see one hand. Wonderful. Let's put our hands together. Anybody else? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. Up on the balcony. I can't see everyone up on the balcony. But if you prayed this prayer, just raise your hand up. Oh, I see another hand already up here. God bless you. One more hand here. One more back, way back there. Three. Up on the balcony. I can't see you. All right. Just raise your hand up because we want to give you a green bag. Our greeters will come up to you right here up in front as well. Uh, just put your hand up and right up here and we will make sure right here okay god bless you uh, along with the green bag they'll give you a card that says decision card if you just write your name and number hand it back to them uh, somebody from the church office will call you tomorrow and give you instructions on how to grow in your faith we'll be in touch with you and just guide you through your journey of faith. Now, in case you didn't get that card on the way out, our, our, our greeters will be there. Just tell them, I want to receive this bag and the card, and they'll give it to you at our exits. Take a few moments to pray, and, and I want you to just pray a couple of things. One is, God, I don't want to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am separated to the gospel. I serve God in the gospel. I'm ready to preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Father, I pray that as a people, God, we will not be ashamed of the gospel concerning Jesus Christ, who was attested to be the Son of God with the power of the Holy Spirit and raised up from the dead. God, let a holy boldness come over all of us as believers that we will not be ashamed of our faith in Jesus Christ. And Father, we also pray, let's pray for the second thing, that we will bless one another with the spiritual grace God has given to us. That when we interact, we'll say, God, help me to release a spiritual gift, a spiritual grace. And we can mutually be encouraged. Father, we pray that we will bless each other by imparting to one another, sharing with one another the spiritual grace, the gifts you've given us, Lord, to bless one another. We'll enrich each other's lives. We will share what you've given to us. Help us to do that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close with a benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.